I've never known a dictatorship to arm its own people. And what we saw there was exactly the opposite of that. Uh, our next speaker is um, a hero of mine. Um, I didn't tell him that yet, but I just did. <laughs> um, Camilo Mejia um, is an Iraq war veteran and a war resistor. I remember reading his stories, and it was so inspiring of what he did. He was born in 1975. Um, in Managua, Nicaragua, but moved to the United States at an early age. After five months in active combat in Iraq, Camilla refused redeployment to his unit in Iraq, choosing instead to publicly decry the war as an immoral criminal war of aggression. As a result of his public stance, he was court-martialed and jailed for desertion. Following nine months of incarceration at Fort Sill Military Prison, Camilo was released and became a writer, speaker, and activist in the military resistance movement. His memoir, The Road from Ramadi, The Private Rebellion of Staff Sergeant Camilo um, Mejia. Um, this is Camilo. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying that we didn't write our speeches together, I swear, but uh, th there seem to be so many recurring themes, uh, which I think it's a testament to the times that we're in. On November 1, 2018, John Bolton gave a speech in Miami in which he first referred to the uh, Troika of Tyranny to refer to Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, stating that the three countries are causing tremendous amount of human suffering. So today, as I sit here and speak to you, I would like to speak to you as a Nicaraguan, a Sandinista, and a proud citizen of the Troika. Because being a citizen of the Troika means that my country is a main target of U.S. aggression, which means we must be doing something good. And just like the Axis of Evil speech uh, back in 2002 when George W. Bush lay down what would become uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. This uh, Troika of Tyranny speech also has basically laid down the foundations of U.S. aggression towards Latin America. So I'd like to speak a little bit of the context that we're in, even though it may feel a little bit repetitive because of what my um, two colleagues here have spoken about. Uh, but in simple terms, I believe that the uh, time of U.S. hegemony has come to an end. And what we're also seeing, it's, it's actually a lot more serious than that, because what we're also seeing is that the uh, neoliberal economic world order also has proven itself to be ineffective and to be causing tremendous amount of suffering, human suffering, as opposed to the Troika. And so what have these uh, neoliberal policies caused? They have caused gross inequality, uh, environmental destruction, uh, great poverty, disease, uh, infant and maternal mortality, the destruction of country's infrastructure, the destruction of country's sovereignty. And alongside that, what we have is a world of emerging world powers that are taking a pr an approach that is very different and that is basically grounding its new relationships in, 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 in collaboration, in the rebuilding of infrastructure, the development of new cleaner technologies. And so what we're seeing really is that we're seeing that there's an alternative being created in the face of all this neoliberal suffering. And yet, what we see is that the United States, rather than change its ways and right its many wrongs, uh, continues to make the same mistakes and to try to impose its neoliberal policies all over the, um, the American continent and the world. I don't have to convince you that many of the um, uh, disastrous impacts that we are seeing in Latin America and the rest of the world, we are also seeing here. Um, the uh, neoliberal policies of privatization and austerity have caused the vast majority of people living in the United States uh, great suffering from gentrification to environmental injustice and destruction to police and state brutality to housing, healthcare, and education crisis. Neoliberalism, not the Troika, is causing all this tremendous 
human and environmental suffering. The situation, as my colleagues have said, um, my comrades have said, uh, abroad isn't any less urgent. The massive uprisings that we're seeing from Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and San Pedro Sula, to Paris, France, and throughout the rest of the world, are in direct response to the impact of neoliberal policies and the impact that that's um, having on the vast majority of humanity. Neoliberal policies that translate to environmental destruction, morbid rates of mortality, hunger, disease, and war, only to name a few. So here we are this evening. And what more could we possibly ask for than to be able to participate in an anti-imperialist conference in the belly of the beast? In this time of transition of global scale, we are at the very epicenter of that transition, which means that we have to be very aware of the circumstances and historical context in which we find ourselves, which presents many dangers, but also many opportunities. And in order to address those opportunities, I'd like to maybe just for a few minutes go back to the Troika. And I'll speak more specifically about Nicaragua. Between the years of 1926 and 1933, the United States used a big portion of its military power including warships, artillery, and thousands of well-armed U.S. Marines to capture and kill the last remaining of the rebel generals in Nicaragua, Augusto Cesar Sandino. General Sandino gave birth to the popular and anti-imperialist struggle for sovereignty and independence from the United States when he refused to accept terms of a truce that would have resulted in handing control of the country and its resources to the United States. He continued to fight a, a guerrilla warfare in which he and his men were at a gross disadvantage. Yet thanks to the intimate knowledge of terrain, popular support, and the unbreakable resolve of his patriotic army, General Sandino prevailed in 1933, and since then, the Marines have never occupied Nicaraguan territory again. Woo! However, the United States did not give up. They simply resorted to the use of lies and betrayal to obtain what General Sandino had denied them for years in battle. They employed the services, the services of a bourgeois liberal general named Anastasio Somoza to lure General Sandino into a trap, and he assassinated him exactly 86 years ago today. But the legacy of General Sandino inspired the struggle for liberation of a revolutionary movement that not only eventually defeated what became the Somoza dynasty, which ruled Nicaragua for more than 40 years, but which also became one of the three governments collectively known today as the Troika of Tyranny. Of course, I'm talking about the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN, the colors of which I'm wearing around my neck tonight. And so, when the Sandinista National Liberation Front defeated the US-supported dictatorship of the Somoza family in 79, the United States did not wait long to launch a counteroffensive to retain control and began training and financing the, mer the mercenary army known as the Contras. But since U.S. Congress had banned the funding of mercenary angry, uh, armies, the Reagan administration had to resort to creative ways to support the puppet army, including the sale of weapons to Iran during the Iran-Iraq War, a scandal that became known as the Iran-Contra affair. That was the same war in which the U.S. armed the Iraqi army of Saddam Hussein with chemical weapons which were later used, used against Kurds and the Iranian military and civilian population. Another scheme to keep the war going saw the CIA facilitating the trafficking of crack cocaine into African-American neighborhoods in L.A., which became not only a health epidemic but also a social one as it created a violent drug trafficking environment causing alarming rates of addiction, mental health issues, unemployment, homelessness, to name a few, all while the Reagan administration cut funding to social programs, including mental health services, housing, education, and other basic needs. When the FSLN lost the general election in 1990, a series of neoliberal governments immediately began to undermine all of the achievements of the revolution, including the land reform, the literacy campaign, victories in gender equality, health care, education programs, workers' rights, and much more. The country ceased to be a sovereign state nation to become a cheap market for transnational companies to savagely exploit 
with no regard to the country's people or its natural environment. A situation similar to the, drop, to the drug epidemic of LA ensued in Nicaragua as most of our citizens lost the safety net that had been provided by the Sandinista government. Mortality rates once again skyrocketed, campesinos lost their land, illiteracy went through the roof, poor children became malnourished, massive unemployment led to higher crime rain, rates and unsafe neighborhoods. And with the sale of the electric company, the country went into a 16 year period of literal darkness. It's gonna be more like five. Despite the grim reality that befell Nicaragua for 16 years, uh, the United States government or the US corporate media never reported much less complain about the morbid existence of most Nicaraguans during the 16 year neoliberal period. There were no human rights organizations writing reports about the alarming rates of mortality, hunger, disease, or anything else called the privatization and austerity neoliberal policies. The Organization of American States never expressed any interest in the country, despite blatant electoral fraud overseen by the United States to prevent the Sandinistas from returning to power. It was as if the country did not exist anymore. So today, Sandinista government in power for 12 years has been able to cut poverty in half, extreme poverty by two thirds, provide universal health care and education to all our citizens, rebuild their infrastructure, our infrastructure, become one of the safest nations in Latin America, achieve 90% of food sovereignty, increase access to electric power from 54% from to 92%, launch credit and lending programs to support hundreds of thousands of micro, small and medium sized businesses that place the country in the top three nations in the world in terms of gender equality. Nicaragua, <laughs> Nicaragua is not alone in these achievements. Under Presidents Chavez and Maduro, despite constant U.S. intervention in the form of sanctions, sabotage, and regime change operations, Venezuela has launched a series of programs designed to promote the development of the South American nation, including housing programs that have built approximately three million homes for Venezuela's poorest citizens. <laughs> Food distribution programs, education programs, and much more. In the case of Cuba, not only has the revolution survived over 60 years of economic, political, diplomatic, and even military war from the United States, they have managed to achieve incredible victories in healthcare and education, not to mention medicine, climate resilience, the development of a sustainable economy, and much more. Of the hundreds of millions of hungry children who roam the world homeless, not a single one of them lives in Cuba. As a revolutionary island, despite decades of US aggression, has managed to completely eradicate homelessness. This is the Troika. But I share all of this with you, not in the interest of my country or Venezuela or Cuba. I'm sharing this with you tonight because I keep hearing people say that the enemy of my enemy is not my friend, or denouncing US imperialism doesn't mean that we have to support dictatorships. Another common one is we must support grassroots movements standing up to totalitarian regimes, even if they once were progressive. So let me tell you something. The enemy of your enemy, namely the Troika nations, as well as other nations who are being targeted by US regime change policies and other forms of aggression, are not being targeted because they are dictatorships. They are being targeted because we represent an alternative to the prevailing neoliberal world order. Right. Which is the same world order that's denying American youth of a bright future that's destroying our environment, that's turned basic human necessities into products to be bought and sold in transnational markets. We need to build a united anti-imperialist, internationalist movement that is capable to understand the historical moment in which we find ourselves. A movement that is capable to tell the difference between an economic model that serves the interests of the poor and not the interests of the rich and transnational corporations. We need to understand how US funded NGOs have seized control of the post truth narrative of dictatorship and democracy, and how they have weaponized identity politics, human and civil rights to create division among us and to redirect our solidarity efforts 
towards the rejection of governments and revolutionary movements that are fighting tooth and nail against the very same policies that are causing tremendous human suffering and environmental degradation in our communities right here in the United States. U.S. imperialism has many allies, very powerful allies, and they are not divided. They don't waste time vilifying each other as they launch media smear campaigns that pave the way for regime change in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia, and everywhere else, where they are burning black and brown bodies and destroying progressive programs for the poor under the guise of pro-democracy movements. The same people who flood U.S. streets with drug and violence are supporting efforts to overthrow revolutionary governments. The same people that have facilitated the use of chemical weapons against the Iraqi Kurds and Iranian military and civilian populations and who are demolishing Palestinian homes are funding mercenary armies in places like Colombia and Nicaragua and they are behind the narratives that keep us debating the merits and flaws of revolutionary governments fighting for self-determination while they stand united in the destruction of our environment, our future and our ability to live a life with dignity and to fight for what is decent and right. So, to wrap up, I stand here tonight, or I sit here tonight rather, as a proud citizen of the Troika, a Nicaraguan, as someone who has been a Sandinista since before birth, because both of my parents were insurgents in the, in the fight against Somoza, and who will remain Sandinista until the very moment I draw my last breath. And I'm not here to apologize for it. I'm not here to apologize for my government as we build this movement. I am not here to request help for our struggle. I am here to tell everyone that your struggle and mine are one and the same. And that if we are to work together, as we should, we must build an anti-imperialist movement that is grounded in a strong understanding of regime change in the 21st century and that is capable to go beyond the cor corporate headline to dig deeper, to reach across smear campaigns and see through the smoke screen of, of imperialism in order to see the values, the values that unite our struggles and that can help us work together as we fight for a better world. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful.